One of the Greenbelt's main goals was to protect ecologically sensitive land. The job, of course, is not yet done. Joining us now for more on what the government of Ontario should do next, here's Gord Miller. He's the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, and we're happy to welcome you back to TVO. Pleasure for to what be I suspect could be the last time. Your could term be. is up in May, right? Could be, that's okay, right. Okay, we shall see. Anyway, thanks for coming in this time. Take us back to before 10 years ago. Sure. Before the Green Belt was officially in place, how differently did they do things back then compared to how things are handled now? Well, let's look, look can I turn that around and say, let's look, look, talk about how the Green Belt emerged and what the Green Belt is. <clears throat> you, you really have to go back 30 years ago and look at the Niagara Escarpment uh, Act, where, where they protected the Niagara Escarpment, a landscape form, and that's quite unique and has been protected all this time. Internationally <coughs> recognized right. biosphere by the United Nations. That's right. In 2001, the then Tory government added the Oak Ridges Marine Conservation Act to protect the land form that was the Oak Ridges Marine, the great reserve of natural lands and, and groundwater north of, the, north of the, uh, the city. And when the Liberal government came out with the Greenbelt Act, they took those two previous pieces of land, so Niagara's Carbon and the Oak Ridges Marine, and added what they call a protected countryside, which was the agricultural land and some natural lands on the fringe of the GTA expansion area. And, and added that, and then collectively that became the Green Belt. So there has been an evolution. And actually, there's another step that's not often talked about. Subsequently, a few years later, they had to do another plan for the uh, Lake Simcoe Protection Act and to protect the lands around Lake Simcoe. So it's been a piecemeal effort of land use planning, adding on, growing this thing over the years. So. Well, that does raise this follow up, which is I do remember 10 years ago when all this was happening, there were, there were allegations that the lines were being drawn on the map with more of a view to sort of um, political science as opposed to geographic or actual science. What's your view on that? Well, you know, I, I, I think that's true, uh, but, I th but I'm very forgiving on that because, you know, when the, when the, when the Tories drew the Oak Ridges Moraine uh, de boundaries, they're, they're, that's a geologic feature, and so you can actually identify reasonably what is the edge. But when the, the Liberals tried to bring the Green Belt, put the protected countryside, they had to trade off between lands that were going to be for development, what so-called the, the White Belt, as some people call it, the lands that weren't green and weren't protected, uh, versus the lands, uh, cultural lands that, that were going to be. So, th you know, those are, those are socio-economic decisions they had to make. Uh, there was no natural land or boundary that, uh, that one could draw. The environmental people would draw a very big green belt mm -hmm. if they had choice, and the developers would, would draw a big white belt, so somebody had to make a call. How strong would you say the protection of those lands inside the green belt now is today? It is, pr I'll say, pretty good. I mean, because we have seen some, con uh, you know, some compromises made, mostly up in uh, the Barry uh, Simcoe area. But we, we've, we've seen changes in, in the growth plan and and taking advantage in some, uh, of some some lands that were intended not to be developed. So, uh, so we the, the pressure still exists, and it's not a perfect system. But you know, on the on the whole, one has to look at it realistically and say. Uh, uh, the exit, you know, the, the protected countryside, the part that was added uh, 10 years ago, um, has been largely, continues to be protected. So I, you know, give it a, a reasonable pass. Well, it, it le I'm going to pull a quote here from a guy you knew, I think, Brian Mulroney, yes, who always said, don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. So let's compare the kind of protection land in the green belt has versus how other lands of similar quality are being protected around the world. On that scale, how are we doing? On that scale, there are lands in other jurisdictions that are more absolutely protected, where they brought, drew a line and it, it becomes absolute. You don't have to go very far, you just have to cross the border into Quebec to find it, uh, areas of lands where the rural, that they made many, quite a few decades ago now, they made that decision. They said, where are the uh, extent urban boundaries of these the towns and cities going to be? Uh, they came to a resolution on that, drew a line, and as far as I know, it has not been compromised, and that hmm. the uh, rural lands are rural lands, so they're bought and sold as rural lands. The problem in Ontario is if, if there is the possibility of getting the land converted and taken out of the green belt, then, then the value goes way up. Sure. And, and uh, so it's, we have to remove that possibility. And other jurisdictions, some of them have absolutely. Germany, France, you don't go and take prime agricultural land in those countries and say, oh, we're now going to convert it uh, w without compensation to some other use. Hmm. Uh, if you look at what's been done with the green belt and you add the Places to Grow Act, which is another law in the province of Ontario that tries to regulate growth, uh, do we now have a very clear idea about where you can and can't develop in this province? Yeah, I'd say we do, uh, aside from these compromises, but uh, uh, we have a, 
a good idea, and there's, there's quite a bit of land available to develop. You know, I mean, that was when they did this green-white thing, they left a lot of white. So, you know, there is room for quite a bit of urban expansion in that sense. But the pressure to c constantly uh, to compromise that is always on. If you look out outside the green belt, you jump over the green belt into the you know, Kitchener-Waterloo area, you find out there's been a you know recent uh, Ontario Municipal Board decision, which is very unfavorable to the planning where they're trying to protect uh, green lands there. So, uh, and why would uh, that be? Well, it, it's just an interpretation of the growth plan, really, mm -hmm. what it comes down to. And uh, and that was for those people who are trying to increase density and keep the urban areas away from the rural areas. That that is considered a a, a, a setback or a loss. So the pressure exists. Uh, and, but you know, right now, because there was uh, quite a bit of land available for development under the Green Plan ten years ago, and we have because we haven't exhausted that land, we're not doing too badly. But I still think the, you know the uh, the, the I don't want to say the crisis, but the decision point is coming. The, the, when we run out of this the, the land that's on, in the present development uh, plans, and, and we really hit the green belt in the hardest sense, in that there is no more development land, uh, then will the government stand? tough and say it is green and it's not going to be compromised or will they fold that's test is coming soon and you presumably would like very strong politicians to say we have driven we have drawn lines and that's we're right. not moving them and we and respect that that's right and if and, and the way if you dither or if you give the shade of doubt there's huge economic forces in play trying to make that happen and you create expectations in the rural community i mean in fairness to the farmers in the rural community they have to know if their this land is going to be their land is going to be farmland forever or not. Do you think that door is a little bit open right now? I think I'm afraid that there's been a few compromises and uh, and I think there's it, the door is a little bit open, yeah. Hmm. It, uh, you're of course all about the environment and it is not obviously environmentally friendly for people to be driving back and forth uh, through the green belt every day for That's work. True. Is there anything the province uh, can or ought to be doing about sure. that? Sure. Well, I mean, the first one is transit, regional transit. And I know we've, you know, in, in the GTA, that's been a huge topic, but we're nowhere near to the kind of comprehensive regional transit that, that say, for instance, Europe has. So I mean, there's a huge opportunities there. Plus, though, but I think it was re encouraging to me recently. There's been some, uh, you know, the Pembina Institute put out a paper recently, which was very good, I thought, and, and made the point that, you know, the, the, the cost of, if you go out, to uh, one of these outer communities and drive through the green belt every day, you have you, generally a couple has to have two cars, and the cost of all that, the cost of maintaining the automobile and the commuting distance, mm -hmm. even if you do get on the go system, is so huge. Uh, you know, the cheaper house you think you're buying is no cheaper. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you know, the Pembina made the point with the Royal Bank, I believe, that the, that you know there is a risk to you know the pay payment of mortgages and things of financial costs that, that strain the couple's uh, economics. Why not? have higher density in the urban areas, get rid of the second car, maybe maybe even the first car, <laughs> and live the urban lifestyle. And those kind of decisions are being made by the next generation. The answer would be because there's not adequate transit in place yet to, to lead that kind of life. Well, for some people... Some would are, argue. Yeah, some, but some, would, some are, and I, you know, of course the, the mayor of Toronto is dealing with that question very, in a real sense these days. But, uh, but, but that's, I think, the solution, and we're starting to see that thinking, so that's important. Do you think that the... There's a whole debate about intensification, whether we've got enough of it, whether there's enough growth in the, in the big nodes of the big cities. Have the provincial government's plans, in your view, created adequate intensification in the big cities of this province yet? No. No. They're, they're, we still have too much low-density rural growth. Uh, even in the most ambitious plans, there's tremendous amounts of greenfield, low-density stuff, which is too low-density to, to support transit in the long term. So that, mm -hmm. that, you know, you're building into the future a liability as uh, energy costs increase and, and, and things. So uh, it's not enough. Uh, but, you know, aside from that, though, I mean, there's a the bigger question of, you know, we have this incredible problem in the dense GTA and, and housing and these, these stresses and we've got all sorts of cities on the outside of the GTA that are losing population especially up in central and northern Ontario for example for example since North Bay where I live is a is a, a city that has lots of space uh, lots of industrial space to, to rent if you're and very reasonable prices very reasonable prices and you know if you know if you could less than half the cost for a for a uh, and I'm not talking a downtown cost I'm even even uh, you know uh, uh, on the edge of the GTA you can get a, a, a very nice house in North Bay uh, for much much less money so but Sudbury you know uh, even Peterborough much closer in is is quite a bit cheaper mm -hmm. so why do the land use policies always favor uh, the, the very very center for the growth and put all the pressure there
I don't know. Uh, you know, people want to live where people want to live. I suppose. Not much you can do about that, is there? Well, I don't know. I mean, there's... Uh, is there? It, it, sure there is. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's other... If you look at comprehensively at land use planning, there's ways to incent uh, in industrial e location expansion. There's uh, issues about transportation. There's things, mm -hmm. things the government has, has levers that... Uh, uh, can can it make it attractive to be other places? I guess Elliot Lake did that many years ago, didn't they? Where they managed well, sure. to convince. And they're highly remote. I mean, with yeah. all due respect, Elliot Lake. Yeah, for sure. But but it is at, literally at the end of the road, you mm -hmm. know. And it's not. I mean, that's you know, a place like Sudbury is a far more larger, sophisticated center with yeah. huge capabilities and resources. Um, Indeed, uh, the province just opened an extension of Highway 404 to Georgina goes right through the green belt. Yeah. 407 is being expanded. This is the pay highway, the toll highway, being expanded into the green belt mm -hmm. lands. Are you concerned about that? Yeah, I think I'm concerned in the sense that uh, we still seek to, to solve solutions by extending highways. I mean, okay, let's take the 404, which to me is a you know prime example. Okay, extend it all at North Bay if you want, but uh, I drive on the you know 404 occasionally, and it jams just somewhere south of, of, of Newmarket, and it's and it's you know and then clogs and feeds into a clogged 401 and a clogged Don Valley. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is extending it? Yes, you can build more houses, but people can't get into the city any better by extending mm -hmm. it. So, to me, it's the wrong. It's the wrong solution to the problem, and, and uh, yeah, obviously the the solution is to get people out of their cars and into the you know let's have ten minute go service out of the out of uh, Newmarket or out of Richmond Hill like like we have an East West line there or we'll have an East West line. So if you if you that's a real solution. The problem extending 404, I think it's a bit of a mystery. It's, I mean, it's wonderful for the road builders, but I can tell the people who are sitting up at the Major Mackenzie going south on the 404 tomorrow morning, it's not going to make anything better. Mm -hmm. So why do people do it? We're locked into a paradigm of, of automobiles and our solutions to, to highways. Remember, we plan our highways 30 years in advance. Mm -hmm. and, and there's momentum to that. And there's a lot of, you know, people invest a lot of money and, and resources in highway planning and, and highway construction. And we think that way. You know, the Ministry of Transportation, lovely people over there. I know many of them. But it is the Ministry of Highways, really. There's not, and it's over its lifetime, it's had uh, airplanes and trains. and. But, uh, but it's, it's highways, it's and highways. their job is to build more highways. That's what they do. And whether or not they fill up with cars or not is not their problem. Hmm. Overall, then, we've looked at some of the pluses, we've looked at some of the minuses. Has the green belt on balance been good for the province oh, of Ontario? No question, it has. It has. It, 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 you know, it, it's a, may not be the perfect solution, but it, 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 it was necessary and timely, and it has slowed and made us reconsider the fact that we need some on the edge of our ma big urban, you know, Toronto's what, the GTA is like the fourth largest urban center in North America now. And it's and we, what, Mexico, New York, Los Angeles, Toronto. Yeah, and we're bigger in Chicago now. Yeah. And, and so we need some of those rural lands and we need that, uh, at those ecological systems. It's really important. Things like, you know, uh, as an ecologist, I look at the thing completely different. I, you know, when you see uh, uh, those Doppler radar images of the migrating birds hitting the Great Lakes, rising up at night in their numbers 50 to 70 million crossing and where do they descend just into that green belt and and, and part of the urban north, northern part of the urban city where all trees are and and that's their their migration route we need that land not to be all treeless and we hmm. we need to find a balance between eco the ecology of the landscape and the agriculture of the landscape and our urban living at the risk of getting political because i know you are a nonpartisan appointment mm -hmm. Uh, Dalton McGinty was the guy who got this started, right? Well, I mean, yes, the Greenbelt is no question. Mr. McGinty, had, you know, Premier McGinty. So, is he but, entitled but, to some know, credit over that? Hang on here. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Harris government brought in the uh, lands for life. Uh, well, be, no, uh, the uh, Oak, Ridges Oak Ridge Conservation Marine Conservation Act, yeah. right? And. Uh, yeah. Uh, was it uh, was it Davis or, or earlier that brought in the Niagara's Cartman? Uh, John Robarts. Robart, it was Robarts. It was John Robarts. Robarts. Pre Premier Robarts. Yeah. So there are some Niagara's Cartman Commission. Uh, Niagara's Cartman. Yeah. And then uh, Harris brought in the Oak Ridge's Marine, and then McGinty pulled it all together and added to it. So. I look at it as, you know, as a collective effort. It's a lovely diplomatic nonpartisan answer. Well done. <laughs> well done. Uh, it's been around for 10 years, the Green Belt, and I gather they are now about to embark upon yes. a 10-year review. Mm -hmm. uh, you may not be around to influence the review, but if you wanted to take this opportunity to do so, what well, would you I, say I they need to comment. do? In, in advance of this, uh, uh, more than a year ago, I issued a report in advance of this because they're, they're looking at these, uh, these pieces of legislation, the Greenback, uh, Greenbelt Act being the, the key one. Uh, and, and, you know, I was critical of the fact, and I tried to warn people, they haven't collected the metrics. They haven't, there aren't things, you know, they haven't been measuring things to what, say. What do you need to know? Well, uh, okay, how much agricultural land has been lost? 
um, how much uh, ec have the ecological lands improved? You know, the, the forested areas improved or not? Um, what of the you know what are the impact? How f how fu functional is the agricultural landscape? I mean, I've heard farmers complain that they've lost their agricultural implements dealer, or, you know, because there's there's doubt about the future of the land and that sort of thing. Like, are these pol uh, these these policies actually are there ways of measuring that have been successful at perpetuating the agricultural community and protect it, and protecting the natural heritage uh, resources on those lands? And and if there are no measurements, if nobody's collecting the data, if nobody's going out and doing the interviews, then how will we know if you've been successful or not? So I'm very critical that they've not prepared us and they've not measured. And because I've maybe been around too long now, Steve, because fifteen because, years. Yeah, because you've you, been the environmental you, commissioner fifteen I years. I have, and, and I've seen it before that the government says, "Oh, well, we don't know if we succeeded or not because oh, somehow we forgot to put the metrics in place, so we we don't have any measurements." So why are they not doing that? Well, maybe that self answers the question. You can't be criticized if you. Haven't have, got the information. Haven't got the information. I don't know. Maybe that's too cynical. But certainly, I tried to warn them and say we need that information. We need that assessment so that people of Ontario can sit back and say, "Yeah, okay, we're we're good with that." Got a couple of minutes to go here. Let me try and get one more issue on the table, and that is the province. I gather is also considering whether or not to extend the green belt into urban river valleys. Right. Do you think they should? Well, I'm not sure that's correct, to be honest with you. I mean, the, and there's a lot of discussion about the, the extending the green belt because it, the, there is protection for, for significant river valleys in the uh, provincial policy statement already. Uh, there's been lots of discussion about the possibility of extending green belt. And here's, and, you know, people say, you know, do you, Gordon Miller, do you support an extension of the green belt? And I surprise them, I say, uh, no. What I support is instead of every, every time we have land use, plan, uh, land use planning problems, we, you know, we put in the Oak Ridges Moraine Act, the the Green Belt Act, the Lake Simcoe Protection Act. We had a, I had a, uh, an application through my administration on the Paris Gulf Moraine, which was turned down. Mm -hmm. But I say, instead of just doing this patchwork change, clearly we have to do these things because the overall planning process of Ontario doesn't work. Because mm -hmm. every time we have a problem, we have to pass a piece of legislation. And now, you know, Green Belt, if you like, is, 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 the, is the fix for a land use pro a process, planning process that was failing the GTA. So you want a much bigger, I want a bigger thing. Fix, I want the, the land use planning process for at least southern mm. Ontario mm. Uh, fixed in its entirety so that we can make the right land use decisions uh, in not just in, in the GTA but also, you know, well, Kitchener, Waterloo, out into London and, and out the other way. Gord Miller, Environmental Commissioner of Ontario, it's awfully good of you to spend some time with us at TVO tonight as you have many times over your 15 years as Environmental Commissioner. Thanks for being here and good luck with whatever comes next. Thank you very much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.